So anyway, um, yeah, I'm the educational media producer for CADARN and, uh, and that means that I just run our little team and our little team is Russ and Matt and that's it. And we just kind of bumble along and try and make videos, I guess. <laughs> um, so let's just go through the schedule quickly. Did, did anything happen that time? No? For goodness sake. That will work, yeah. We've already mingled. We've done very well at that. Can you guys see it? It's a bit small. Um, my presentation is now, basically I'm going to talk about um, preparing to shoot, the things you do before and some of the things you need to know while you're shooting. Then we're going to have a little, a little break in here. Um, then we'll have the script writing exercise, so I'm going to divide you into groups of two. That was the plan. And I'm going to give you guys a little secret exercise. You, you were at my Breaking the Barriers workshop and it's, it's pretty much the same. Um, so that, you'll do that for an hour and we'll be around to give you any advice you want. Um, then it's lunch for 45 minutes and we'll go over to the big building again. Um, then Russ will take over and Russ is going to talk to, he's going to have a more practical session. We're going to sit down with the kit that you've got and make sure that it's all up and running and he's going to talk to you <coughs> about a few things um, concerned with getting good shot. Um, then another coffee break, then we'll have the shooting exercise. So the script that you did in the morning, we're going to go and uh, go off and shoot. So apparently we've got locations around this building that um, I haven't scoped yet, but <laughs> apparently they're all open for us to use um, that you can go and shoot in. Then we'll come back here. Hopefully you guys will still be able to stay on to have a, a review of your footage. We also need to copy your footage onto your, uh, your drives that you hopefully bought, the USD, USB drive or whatever hard drive you bought, so that you can take your footage home and review it, ready for our editing workshop. Okay, so that's a quick rundown of the day. Right, <coughs> so um, I'm going to just talk to you a bit about the things, some of the things that I've learnt over the past 10 years that I've been involved in, um, in media. Um, most of those 10 years have been spent in, in China, actually, so God knows what I learnt there. Um, I've been involved in news, I've be dabbled in independent documentary, um, and I've worked for Greenpeace as their video producer for a few years. And so I left China about two and a half years ago and I was in Bristol and in Bristol I was a production manager, which is a horrible job, but it's basically doing all the organising and also an editor. So um, they call me a predator, producer editor. <laughs> um, so those are my two areas of expertise really. I do, sh I do shooting as well, but um, generally I find someone who's better at it than me <laughs> to do <laughs> the shooting. Um, and now I'm here in, in Wales exploring the brave new world of educational media. <laughs> so that's a bit about me. And what I want to do today is um, talk to you, oh no, come on, talk to you um, <coughs> just about the things that you have to do before you pick up a camera. Um, all the practical things, but also some of the things that you need to know, some of the theory behind uh, film uh, filmmaking or video making. Um, <coughs> I really want to, my aim is to demystify uh, the process. Um, I really want to show you that it's not that hard. You can do it. Um, I'm having problems with this. I can't see my notes at all. Why is that? Anyway. Uh, is the screen, is no, it's okay. It's okay. It's just me. Um, Um, so, not just in, I don't want to just inspire you to give it a go and show you that it, you know, it's not that hard. <coughs> it, uh, it really isn't rocket science. I also want to make you confident enough to be um, a bit ambitious, to be a little bit more creative and to go beyond just um, a screen and a voiceover, to try and push uh, a bit beyond that. And it is, it's not that hard. So, first of all, to warm ourselves up, Jeez. Let's have a little brainstorming, my favourite thing. <laughs> um, you're all here because you're interested in making educational videos, I guess. Or you were forced to come here by a boss. Um, but let's step back a little bit and consider 
why? Why, why make videos? What, what are we doing? Um, <clears throat> so first of all, maybe we should think about what kind of videos uh, we're making for education. What kind of videos do you make uh, for education? Informative. Informative videos? Publicity. Hmm? Publicity. Publicity videos? That is often what ends up being made, publicity videos. But that's actually not educational. It's just introducing a course. So people often confuse that with, with educational media, with educational video. What we're talking about here is something that actually does the educating, is part of the course. Um, it's, it's too simplistic to see it as being a story, but if it is a story of, of what you're trying to do, yes. the beginning, the middle and the end. Is that yes, no, that's not simplistic at all. Um, it, I think that's, that's one of the main things I want to say to you guys, is story. Story comes first, probably already told you. <laughs> but, um, but what about, in, you know, just in, uh, in genre terms, what kind of videos are we talking about? Um, you know, a publicity video is a genre, kind of, it's a kind of video. Um, like a recording of a lecture, for instance. What other kind of videos will you be making? Kind of case studies of other students, I guess, maybe to... In, yeah, to introduce people to it, to make it not seem so scary to get involved in HE. A case study is, is good, but that's also kind of publicity. But you can, use, you can use a case study or an interview, perhaps, with someone to, to delve into a subject. Um, so, yeah, it's not, not, people use it for publicity, which is not what we're talking about. We don't, that's not what we're talking about now. But I guess you guys are going to take that away. It doesn't matter. Um, Demonstration? A demonstration. Something. Yeah, that's Something great. Practical. Or a how-to video, maybe. Yeah. Oh, I spelled demonstration or how-to videos. Yeah, that is that is a very useful. I, I've seen some videos, um, occupational therapy, um, looking just just showing the bits of the foot. Is that what you do? Yeah. Not me, but yes, yeah. some people do that. <laughs> this is the foot. This is the bits that yeah. go wrong, kind of thing. You know, that's that's really useful as an object, a learning object. Any other kinds of videos that you might want to make? Yeah, uh, like the assignment room, so that students can go home and watch it again and again and again, instead of phoning up and asking again and again and again. Yeah, yeah. That is an important part. Um, I probably spelled assignment. That is a, an important part of what video does. Comedy. <laughs> Comedy. Yeah, I mean, you, you, uh, an important part of video is that they can take it away and watch it any time they want. Um, so anything that needs that, like, um, like any kind of demonstration uh, or assignment brief, or even feedback. Often people use video to do feedback, especially if it's a, if it's a more visual um, type of, of subject, that, like fashion, that they're studying. This is what you've been doing. I'm going to film what you're doing during an assignment. And a recording of an assignment, that's useful. Um, interviews, recording of a lecture. We're trying to move beyond recording of a lecture and, and slides with a voiceover. We're going to move beyond that today. Um, although doing those well is really important. But hopefully by thinking about video in a wider regard, you'll be able to do those well anyway. I think it's critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And like six times different groups so it'd be useful for me to be able to record it put it on the Moodle sites so they can just download it themselves yeah. rather than me can teach them six yeah. times the same thing. Yeah. Well in a way that's that's distance learning isn't it in a way. <coughs> they did do an experiment really early on um, about what students prefer and how students learn and they put two students in adjoining rooms one had the lecturer in, the other had a screen with the lecturer, um, a recording of the lecturer, same time, real time. And then they surveyed um, the experiences of the students. Which, which do you think they preferred? The real time. The real, the real man, the real person, not man, woman, anyone, boy, girl. <laughs> they, they preferred uh, being in the room with uh, the real person. But one of the really good things about 
uh, about recording a lecture um, is also that people can review it again and again, especially at, lecture, at, at, at revision time. I guess that's a lot of people notice that at revision time, anything on their blackboard or their <coughs> Moodle kind of goes whoop, like that. So recordings of lectures. You also record like taster sessions if somebody was thinking of a subject, say to give somebody an overview of if mm -hmm. you studied X, this is what it would involve them. Yeah. Maybe slightly differently as well. Could you, in terms of you know distance learning as well, instead of to take down some of those barriers of being nervous about meeting your tutor, you could do something funny about a certain tutor so that you kind of know what they'll look like, know what they'll sound, that sort of that sort of yeah. thing. I don't know what it would be like exactly, but uh, wearing a sense. wearing a Rudolph nose or something. Yeah. Like I don't know. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, those are some of the videos that you might make. Um, for education, how-to videos, demonstrations, flipped classroom kind of things. Uh, are all of you aware of a flipped classroom situation? A uh, flipped classroom teaching is when you you do some, you make them learn beforehand, and then you use the classroom time, the contact time, to go more in depth or to try out what they should have learned. So, in a way, I'm kind of trying it on you guys by asking you to watch the videos before you came about um, using the kit. Because if you've watched those videos, it might not have gone in, but once you're there with, the, with your hands on the kit, you'll go, oh, that's what you meant, oh, that's what you meant. That's kind of like, I'm trying to do flipped classroom there. Not sure it's gonna work. Um, documentaries, um, interviews. Documentary could be anything, just a recording of an event, um, a recording of something that's only gonna happen once or twice. Um, so, why though? How are these videos, how is video good for learning? How do they help you learn? If a video is good, you can almost feel like you're there. You're taking the if it's done really well, yes. you can actually lose yourself within that video and feel that you're part of it, if it's done well. What if it's done badly? You don't <laughs> want to know. You well, don't want to know, that, that is true. That. Feel like you're there. It's also about how good the information is within it and what you're doing because you can have a, a marvellous piece of film that's very attractive to watch and very funny, but what they're actually telling you is totally irrelevant to what you're trying to do. <laughs> yes, so that, that is um, what makes a good video. Relevant, useful, concise information and high production values. By production values I mean things like the picture quality is okay, the sound quality is okay, that kind of thing. So, yes, video can make you feel like you're there, make you feel it engaged, it entertains you. You want to watch it, right? So that's why it's good for education, because you, you want to watch it. Neil? It can be more memorable. Yes. Mm-hmm. Than just like reading something. Hopefully it yes. is. There is something called <coughs> the illusion of learning which you have to be careful with when it, get, it comes to video. Because video is sit down and watch. And you can lean back and just say, oh, I watched it, I know, I know that stuff now. Um, so it's very easy to think, oh, you've learnt it, but you might not necessarily have learnt it properly. So that's why video has to be um, integrated within your teaching to make it um, a useful learning object rather than just something that you watch. So it's got to be part of something else then? That is the aim, to make it part of something else. It could just be, um, it could just be, what's the word, reinforcing information. Like, you know how at school, when you're at primary school, at the end of term, you were just watching videos and stuff. <laughs> so a bit like, okay, we've learned all that stuff, now let's have a bit of fun and watch a bit more about it, just to widen your, widen your knowledge. That could be, but the aim is to integrate it into your teaching and to promote learning with it, using it. Um, how, how else is it good at educating video? It can be more accessible than having to go to a lecture hall or a seminar or, or, or whatever because people can consume it whenever they can. Yes, so it, it does, it widens access. Yeah. Uh, you, you can, um, it widens access not just like geographically, like if you're at home and you want to watch something, um, or you live in the mountains and you can't get to uni, but it also widens it intellectually. Uh, and by that I mean people learn in different ways. 
some people might learn much better watching a video or listening to something. Um, so, watch, uh, so that's what I mean by widening access intellectually. Um, Certain things such as your video on the camera and things like that for demonstrations, it's, um, it's much clearer and understandable rather than writing, say, a thousand words of how to open a particular chamber with a battery or something. Yeah. So to describe that is, takes lots and lots of words, but to show it is important, oh, that's how you do it. Um, exactly. So some things, in fact a lot of things, are easier to show yeah. uh, than, to ta than to say. Mm. However, I would say that sometimes one of the limits of video is that um, it's not that good at giving complex, in-depth information. Mm. It's more aimed at giving introductory information or simpler information. It has to be, by its very nature, concise. You've only got 100 words per minute. That's all you can do. So those words have to really, really be worth it. See what I mean? It's reflective of everyday life because the majority of people, apart from this lady here, have televisions. And <laughs> I don't have a television. Uh, sensible, but very sensible. <laughs> a lot of people have televisions, yes. and there's an awful lot of money made through television. Yeah. So it's got to be, it's got to work. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, people wouldn't watch it. If it didn't work, they'd just never, you know, people watch it. Mm -hmm. We do, we sit, we come in from work, and the first thing we tend to do is switch the television on. Yeah. And it, it, it works. Yeah, you know? it does. It's, it's a very powerful form of communication. And also people are used to it now. I suppose there's a downside that if you get too relaxed watching it, mm -hmm. that you may not be focusing on what, you know, because you're quite comfortable sat there just sitting back and watching it. So the other stuff that reinforces it needs to get some kind of balance in what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. There really does need to be a balance. So it's that illusion of learning thing again. Although, I mean, you do pick things up <coughs> when you're watching the television. You kind of soak things. And that is a really good way of learning as well, soaking things up. But when you're at university, you kind of have to be a bit more on it than that, I guess. <laughs> you can switch out, you can switch off very easily when mm. you're watching. Yeah. So I think it needs to be um, small short. segments, short, short with breaks in the middle yeah. rather than a, 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 a... You can give a two hour lecture mm. with a break, but I think when you're watching video, you need to have more breaks. I, th I, think, I think you're right. I mean, there has been some research into the length of an educational video and what, how long it should be. I think uh, the organisation was called edX. Um, but I've heard people, since I read that information about, oh, you should keep them short, like four to six minutes, that's a, lot, that's a maximum length. You should keep an educational video. Since I read that, I've heard other people say, not necessarily. In some regards, you do have a captive audience, um, as long as you can keep their attention. So, you know our video on the cameras, they were really long, weren't they? But we try to, we try to um, solve that problem by doing chapter markers. So you didn't, you don't, it's not designed for you to really watch the whole way through. It's designed for you to dip in. So that's one way of dealing with that. So short is a really good thing. It's now quite likely what students would do to a video. If they've been to the lecture, yeah. then that's the back up, isn't it? So what they'll do is, well, there's a point that I didn't quite get in my notes and I want to hear it again, yep. they can go back and revisit it <coughs> and be reminded about what was important. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes when you listen, you don't always pick up on the important bits because yep. you kind of drift sometimes, don't you? Yep. So it's useful to know that you can actually go back mm -hmm. uh, and see what's been said. Chapter markers on YouTube are really useful. Um, yeah, so... Um, could you also, I mean, can we just stop that? You could explore something a bit more than you did in the lecture. So say there's a particular area which you know a certain number of students are interested in, yes. but you can't spend a certain amount of time in a lecture or a seminar on, you can then use this video to get more information out so then they can go out and learn even more independently yeah, yeah. Um, instead of kind of having to st stick to a quite strict syllabus. Yeah, so expanding information, that's, yeah, I think that's a really useful thing. So, so some of the things, the reason that video is good at, at, at educating, it's powerful. You want to watch it. You can watch it anywhere. You can watch it anytime. Um, and what all the, it uses all these different elements, like sound, uh, voice, uh, pictures, um, text even. And all of these things reinforce each other uh, to help the learner, if it's done well, hopefully. Not really confusing you. <laughs> um, and um, it's really good at getting concise, slightly more simple introductory information over. Um, to the audience rather than 
it's not going to get the information that you'd get in a book or a scientific paper. That's what a scientific paper is for. <laughs> okay, what makes a good video? I'm, I'm really testing you guys now before I, before I go on. What makes a good video for education? We've discussed a little bit. Short is one of the things that makes it good. Concise Clear information. Focus. Sorry? Clear focus. Clear focus. Yes, yeah, so that's a technical thing. So techni no technical problems. If you, as soon as you have a technical problem in your video, you lost it. You lost your audience. That is what makes a good video. No technical problems. Concise information. Concise and good information. That's the content. You've got to have content, right? You have good content, or else what's the point of make, putting all that effort into making a video? Um, short. What else makes a good video? Relevant language. Relevant language, yep. And really well thought out language. You might need some jargon in there, but not to be overly jargonistic. No, you don't want to lose your audience. And we're all used to how people speak on television. It's not informal, but it's conversational. Uh, no waffle, I was going to say, because, you know, I, I, I can, Absolutely. when I watch <coughs> certain videos, it's like... Uh, and then you, and then you so scroll you through, the and then you're like, oh, okay, no, scroll through again, and then you're at the end of the video, and you've yeah. missed it all. Yeah. Charismatic communicators. That Ooh. is important. Charismatic communicators. That makes it entertaining and also engaging. Can all of you be charismatic today? We'll try. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a little voice there. <laughs> we'll try. <laughs> Well, that's important, and I'll talk a little bit about that if I get there. Uh, anything else that makes a good video? Russ, I've forgotten what makes a good video. <laughs> Variety of um, shots. Yeah, interesting, uh, varied, uh, visual, visual. It's a video, if we're going to say. Let's make it visual. Yeah, so these are some ideas about what makes a good video. I suppose you have to think about what you're wearing and also about your body movements, because that can be really distracting. Uh, Absolutely. So let's see what you're wearing today. That might be slightly problematic. It's very, very smart and clean, but you've got stripes on your clothes. And those stripes, might, the camera might suddenly go, woo, woo, woo. That's called moiré. And um, it's important to try and avoid that. It doesn't make that sound, though. It, do, it, it, it does. <laughs> in my brain, it goes, woo, woo. That would be interesting. Um, we can have a go. You're, you, it might be OK, but we had a little bit of a shock. <coughs> when we made the JVC video, actually it was completely my fault, um, Russ was wearing, it was, Russ was wearing a, a t-shirt, I don't know if you, ever, if you saw it, a green t-shirt, and the fabric of that shirt, um, it was the weave of the shirt, you wouldn't have thought it because there's no stripes on it or anything, was dreadful, dreadful moiré, all over the place, and I was like, oh yeah, I'll be able to fix it in post, don't ever say that, I did say it, and Matt, we're sat there for days trying to fix that problem in post. And it's just, you can either reshoot it or you can just live with it. It's dreadful, just try and avoid it. Anything with stripes or anything with a close weave that's really obvious, kind of an obvious weave, oh, it's dreadful. Anyway, mea culpa, I did it. <laughs> Don't do as I do, do as I say, right? <laughs> anyway, does anyone know what that picture is? That's Hong Kong, isn't it? It's the, it's the Umbrella Revolution. One of the things that, I, that really... Uh, made me interested about this is how many cameras were there. It was just probably the best photographed occupation that there ever has been. There were all cameras there, as you can see. Anyway, so I just wanted to show you a little bit of a video. This is a video from Derby University. Now, Derby, they won't mind. They won't mind me showing this. Um, Derby is actually really good at this stuff. Um, they've actually got their own little video team that goes and makes videos for for the academics. Um, but this is one that an academic obviously made by himself and I just wanted to show it to you and see what you thought. Hopefully this will work. This is the Maxad area of the Oman Ophiolite. The mountains behind me are part of the mantle sequence and for the most part these rocks are dunitic, unusual part of the mantle sequence lying just below the Moho. And so much of the structures that we see in these brown coloured rocks behind this 
are part of this what we call mantle transition zone or moho transition zone made up of these dunitic rocks. Now one particular feature of this area is that there are a number of important chromite bodies formed in this dunitic transition zone. So we are at the site of some chromite mining. This particular area behind me has been mined out, but there's active mining going okay. on. I'm well aware of the wind in the microphone. Okay, <laughs> that is the first thing that I noticed and Russ noticed and you noticed. Um, a big technical problem. So, it's wind. It's distraction, isn't it? Absolutely, completely distracted. Technical issues like that, actually not that hard to avoid, she says, dealing with technical problem. Um, one would hope not too hard to avoid. It's really, really easy to do. It actually is really easy to do. I did it. I do it all the time. Mia culpa again. Um, but if you just think about it, put your brain into gear, you can avoid it. How would he avoid it? He, he has the kit that he has. He doesn't have anything else. He's set, he's set off to the mountains of Iran or something, and he's making a video on the top of a mountain. What could he have done, do you think, to avoid that wind problem? Taking the right sort of mic. Yeah, but he's only got what he's got. Maybe he hasn't got the right kit. Stood somewhere more sheltered. Huh? Yeah, stood somewhere more sheltered. Tried to block the wind from his mic. Obviously, maybe he had um, a tripod. I'm not sure how he's recording it. Another thing he could have done is stand closer so the, the level of the wind and the level of his noise was different. The wind was kind of like that. Um, the wind was there and his voice was kind of there because he was standing so far away from his mic. Um, there, are th there are things you can do, like really basic things you can do to, to get away from that kind of issue. When you experimented, Lizzie, beforehand, do a couple of tries yeah. to see how it sounded and maybe maybe move around and yeah. work out the best way to do it. Yeah. Absolutely. You should you should always give it a go. So any problem that you guys had with your legria, for instance, if you've given it a go beforehand, you might have been able to detect that problem and then sort it out before you shot. You see what I mean? Um, what else was wrong with that video? The transition was a bit harsh. Why do you think that was harsh? It was kind of like OK, I'm talking here, and now all of a sudden I'm here. You know, he could have said in his video, and I'm going to go and look down at this, and even, even if it had transitioned quickly, <coughs> if he had introduced that he was going to look at something else, it would have been a lot more, oh, OK, okay yeah, um, instead of all mm. of a sudden he's in a quarry. Well, do you know what? Um, that was a very harsh t transition, and one of the reasons wasn't what he said, but the picture. If you notice, the first picture and the second picture were pretty much the same in terms of, of um, how far away he was from the camera and where he was standing. There was no difference. Yes, um, he was still standing right in frame. He was still standing right in frame, but still a wide shot of him, and suddenly he's in a different place. So it jarred in your mind, and that's one of the main reasons why. If he'd uh, done a completely different shot or done a cutaway of the rocks or something, um, you wouldn't have had that feeling so much. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the problem with that video is, like, it's just him talking, blah, 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 and he's not even thinking about what he's talking, really. I mean, he knows all this stuff, and he's just spouting it. He hasn't thought about what the purpose of his video is or how he's going to use it to teach, um, teach his students. I really think it's such a shame because it's a wasted opportunity. He's gone to this place, obviously for some kind of research. He could have used it. One of the things he could have done is filmed lots of interesting shots of different things and then done a voiceover when he got home to explain it, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, him being in the environment is really important, but he didn't have to have the whole thing with him in the environment. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There were loads of other things, simple things he could have done to make it better. How about this one, then? Got another one to show you guys. Could you have done anything about, I know it's a sunny day, but all his face was in shadow. Because <coughs> he had the pink cap on and the sunglasses. Yeah. So you could barely see any... Oh gosh! Facial. So although he was there, you didn't see any facial movement. Well, he was too far away from the camera, yeah. basically. It was just like, I'm standing here next to the mountains and I'm basically part of the scenery. Mm. So there was no engagement like that. Yeah, but how about this one? Here I have a disc of wood with a hole cut out of it. Now most people know an object like this will tend to hang heavy side down. But check this out. I'm going to spin the disc and watch what happens to the hole. It goes to the bottom. Even though it's lighter, it goes down. How does that make any sense? It's like the center of mass of this disc is moving up. 
Let's try it again, just make sure it wasn't a fluke. No, the hole goes to the bottom. The lighter part goes to the bottom. Well, let me try spinning it with the lighter part already at the bottom. Will it flip? Does it just flip? No, this time the hole stays there. So the hole clearly wants to be at the bottom while it's spinning. But why is that? Well, I don't want to give you the answer right away. So make me a video response and I'll pick the best video response and I'll put it in my explanation video. So subscribe to find out how this works. You know who it's by. <laughs> okay. What about that video? He was more charismatic. He yeah. was charismatic. That is true. And he was drawing people in because he was, he was the questions were the questions that they might ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's more interaction. <laughs> There was, there was definitely interaction because he was asking people a question and asking them to respond. Making you think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that's like, it's kind of like more integrated because like here's something for you to do, then I'm going to integrate what you do in my answer. There were a mixture of shots as well. Mixture um, of shots, exactly. He was, it was closer, wasn't it? Yeah, and they weren't, they weren't exa exactly like clean shots either, so it wasn't as if... It had to be completely clinical, or, you know, uh, with just a fair, and because of the setting he was in, he wasn't in a room. He'd gone somewhere that actually has very little. He's, he's <coughs> the Sydney Opera House behind him. That has nothing to do with the fact that he's spinning. That is true. That's a bit weird. Wood. That is a bit weird. <laughs> but anyway, he was just there. Yeah, um, he went from him to the block of wood and back again. Absolutely. So he's he's putting some variety in there. To that. Yeah. It's my doing it on the floor rather than just standing behind a table. Mm. You know, and then getting down. Yeah. It made it more interesting. Okay. His language was simpler, much more conversational as well. Um, much more about, you know, what do you think, you know, um, that kind of thing. Yep, it was, he was communicating on their level. Not lecturing at them. Not lecturing at them, absolutely. I'm sorry, this is something that you want to know about. Yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I want to know about it, but it was really interesting. I'm now I'm intrigued, <laughs> I'm intrigued. So, um, so that's some stuff you to think about let's talk a little bit about um more stuff as we go through today let's just have bellis in mind you probably saw that last time i like that picture <laughs> um it's just a little thing that i don't know if it's going to help your thinking content is king quality is queen story is supreme and hopefully uh, i'll get you to understand what story means as we go through the day content obviously is the stuff that you're saying quality is obviously no wind noise and story what is that? Does that work? Um, just a few keys to success. As you go through your, uh, as you start on your production journeys, don't be lazy. Um, and that just means it's hard work. Like making anything is hard work, right? Um, when you write a book, if you're an academic and you're writing a book, like you probably have to, it's hard work. Making a video is less work than that, <laughs> especially if it's a short video. So yeah, just, just put the effort in and you'll get, you'll get stuff out in the end. Um, practice, don't give up. Um, just keep going, keep trying. The first video you make is not going to be good. The second one's going to be much better. It really is, especially if you engage with what you're doing. Um, plan as much as possible. possible. Planning is key to pre-production, which is what I'm talking about now, and, and, and to the success of the next stages. And most importantly, does anyone know what this means? Does anyone know what KISS means? Keep it simple. Yeah, you would ask that. <laughs> keep it simple, stupid. It basically means just keep it simple. It's a, it's, a good, um, it's a good thing to apply to the whole of your life, really. OK, so uh, the different stages of production, just so you know, keep it in your brain. Um, there's pre-production, which is what I'm talking about. Now it's when you do the planning and the creative thinking in terms of the script and things like that. Filming is when you go off and shoot your script and when all your planning pays off, hopefully. Post-production is, you guys were at the post-production workshop, editing your film, making it out of the footage that you've taken. And then you've got distribution at the end, which uh, could last as long as the video exists, really. So where are you going to put it? How are you going to use it um, in your teaching? Then uh, people have asked me, um, how long does it take? How long does this production process, all those, those four stages take. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention that all of those stages, they're all integrated. They're all uh, informed upon each other. And to be good at 
pre-production, you really need to know about filming uh, and, and know about post-production as well. You need to know about all of those stages to do the first stage or the last stage well. Uh, you need to know about distribution uh, before you start your film. You know, how are you going to use it before you actually start writing the script? Those are all useful things to know. Anyway, how long does it take? Well, you know, I'm one of these people who... Uh, has anyone heard the, um, the luggage rule? The suitcase rule? Well, maybe it's thing that only applies to women. Um, yeah. Give me a bag. Doesn't matter how big it is, I'll fill it. <laughs> give me two weeks to make a video. I'll use two weeks. Give me a year, I'll use a year. <laughs> What? Give me a raise, I'll spend it. You've got more yes, you exactly. Spend it. That's true. <laughs> so it's a bit like that with video production. It really is. Um, it does take longer than you expect. Um, but this is the kind of a vague idea of the proportions that you should be spending on it. I put the idea in there. First of all, you need an idea, right? Then you've got to work on the idea. You've got to write the script, um, and you've got to plan your shoot. Then the filming should only take a small proportion of your time. You shouldn't be out there filming the whole time because you should have planned it. Then post-production, you do have to fiddle quite a lot in post-production. You're sitting there going, oh, I'll put that shot there, I'll put that shot there. So it does take a bit of time. So that's the rough proportion, the proportions of time that you should be spending. Uh, let's talk about the 1%, shall we? Genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Right? <laughs> I guess so. Uh, you do have to start from an idea, um, and that is an important uh, first place to start. It's important because um, it informs everything else. So where did your idea come from? <coughs> Hopefully it comes from a need. Hopefully you're making a video and you're putting effort in because there is a need in your students. Your students need to know something, they're not getting something in your lecture, you're thinking well maybe I could show it. Maybe there's a better way of teaching them. So hopefully it comes from a need. <coughs> Once you've had an idea you need, to, um, you need to interrogate it. You need to develop it. You, need, you interrogate it by, by asking questions like, do I really need to make a video? Or is there another uh, better thing to do? Is there something else that I can do um, that isn't going to take so much effort but gets the same results? Don't put the effort in unless you need to. Um, you can also ask yourself, how am I going to use this in my teaching? I really need to know how I'm going to do that. It is a mistake that a lot of people make, as I've already mentioned. They don't think about that. They don't think about how the, fa the fact that this is an educational object. Um, uh, and you've got to ask yourself, you, you know, how, um, what do I actually want to say? What is it that I really want to say? So when you've had your idea, start interrogating your idea and start developing it. Um, once you've uh, done that, you can start taking the first steps. Now, um, Obviously, I've already said that. Work out how, uh, videos, how the video is going to be used in your teaching. Research and find references. Um, actually, I find that a really useful pro uh, part of the process. If you think about a documentary on television, do you know how much time they put into research? They've got a whole band of researchers looking into it and finding interesting stories to put into the documentary. So research, I mean looking into your subject. You might know it very well, but what uh, extra research do you need to to put in. When we make our camera videos, we actually really look into it quite in depth to work out what we're going to say. And we also find references. Other videos have been made, like the one that you want to make, uh, that help you, inform you. Um, and also, you can share that video and say, look, this is what I want to make. Uh, can I do that, boss? Am I allowed to go <coughs> off and make a video like this? You can copy it as well. References are really, uh, are really, really useful. Um, you can, then, then you go off and you write a synopsis of the video's contents, and that really helps your thought, thought processes. If you write down uh, just a paragraph of what it is that, you're want, that you want to say, and that should include things like how long is it going to be, think about, how, uh, think about that, think about the structure, think about what elements you'll need to, to say what you want to say. Do you need an interview? Or is it just an interview? Or do you need some titles on the screen, maybe? Start thinking about that kind of thing. And then you make a, a production plan. Uh, when do I need this by? When do I have to shoot that event? You, you start thinking about, about that kind of thing and planning uh, the work that you're going to put in, the input. So that's a bit about the planning and the first steps. Then you can write a script. You've got, this is a template, and you've got uh, the template in your packs that you can you'll be using later on this morning. It's actually a really useful template. So a lot of educational videos are going to be quite verbal. There's going to be 
a lot of talking. In fact, the talking, uh, the script, the narrative is what comes first often, and that's fine. But let's not waste uh, the value of video, which is visual. So this script uh, forces you to think visually. It forces you to think, what picture am I going to have while I'm saying that wor those words? So you write a sentence, and you think, actually, I want a really nice picture of the Welsh mountains here. Uh, because that's going to uh, illustrate my point, because I'm talking about farming, maybe. I'm talking about the weather, something like that. So um, it's in sections there, because it's, um, it's, it's broken up in shots. So the first shot, you might just have a video of just, you know, Lizzie talking about some, some camera, right? That might be just what the shot is. But if you noticed in my video, there were close-ups as well, things like that. Um, so that's what, um, that's what you put in in, in, in the script. So hopefully you're, you're going to have a go at using that um, later on this morning. Um, <clears throat> I would say that you really do always need to write a script. It's a, even if it's just a really basic video, it really helps you to write a, a, a script, even for documentary. A script isn't just for fiction film, it's for documentary. So if you're going to make a little video about how to use a library, how to find a book in the library, um, you might be shooting some, like, some students looking for books and stuff. What do you want to shoot? That's what your documentary is. What is your plan? So that's what a script is for something that you're not controlling. Um, and even for an interview. So you're interviewing something, somebody, you have no idea what they're going to say, but you know, what they, you, you know what you want them to say. That's what goes in your script. Don't feel straight jacketed by it, though. It's just a blueprint. It's an idea. Don't say, I have to get this, I have to get this, I have to get this, because it will change. Right. Um. <coughs> <coughs> How to write a good script? Oh, it's quite hard, I don't know, because there's so many different scripts you could write, but um, the concise language that we were talking about before, that's really, really important. Um, start by grabbing their attention. What shot or what words or how am I going to get people to watch this video? The video that we had at the beginning of the man standing in the mountains, maybe he could have had a lovely shot of a pan of the mountains to start, to make people intrigued. Or maybe he could have had a close-up of some rock, interesting rock formation, and people have gone, ooh, what's that? I'm a geologist, I'm really interested. I don't know. What other ways do you think you can grab attention? Some sort of interesting sort of graphics or something. You know, like that second one opened with loud music as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Or doing something unexpected. Doing something unexpected. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Something, uh, maybe asking a question. Um, society's conventions. Sorry? So you're tapping into society's conventions, a uh, uh, <coughs> behaviour we've been taught. So for example, um, if somebody's going to watch a television program, there's a, a, there's a song or music at the beginning which alerts people to it's what they want to watch. Mm -hmm. So, and, and people at the beginning of Coronation Street, so it's just yeah. cracking. Right. Okay. So, for example, at the beginning of Coronation Street, you don't start with a program, you start with music. And people hear this and they, they finish making their cups of tea and they come and sit down to watch it. Yes. Similarly, in a classroom, you say, Well, I'm going to put a film on, and you so you go through a process of behaviour which says actually something interesting is going to happen now. It might be as boring as hell, but the reality is you go through this set of conventions and people are trained to respond in a certain manner, which is we sit down and shut up or maybe get the popcorn out, whatever it is. Yeah. Do, do you know, sorry, that would just be one of my. That's, that's interesting, yeah. But using music is, is a really good way of, of grabbing attention. It is. People like to hear, hear music, although don't overdo it with music. Oh, God, yeah. you can, you can sometimes what kind of thing you're going to get. Uh, years ago I used to do, uh, yeah, you, you can, yeah, you can tell. As long as you use the right music, which yes. is actually really hard, choosing music, if you've got an extra day in your production plan, go and choose some nice music. If you don't, just ignore music, that's what I would say. Or you can go and compose it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> music is a slightly <coughs> difficult one. I love choosing music. I spent one or two days to choose music for my videos. I do, I seriously do. Um, anyway, <laughs> so grab by their attention, do something beautiful, music, interesting, unusual. Um, 
you need a beginning, a middle and an end. We talked a bit about that in the post-production workshop. It sounds like a bit of a truism, it's like a throwaway comment, but if you think about it, it's not. Try and put a beginning in there, a middle in there, and an end. Something that starts it, the content, the main bit in the middle, the action, and something that wraps it all up. Right? You've got it then, right? Um, think in terms of sequences, scenes, and acts. So, even the most basic of videos has acts. Like, uh, the a as, you can, um, as you know, a, a play has three acts normally. Um, a video often does as well. It's just the beginning, middle, and end. Even the most basic video does. Um, that basic video about the spinning wheel, uh, the spinning top, the spinning piece of wood, that had a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, three acts, in a way, in a very basic way. Um, he started out by saying, I've got this. Then he did the spinning. Then he said, what do you think? Three acts, in a way. <laughs> Pushing it a bit. Um, sequences, every action, you're filming action, hopefully, even if you're just doing a, sh uh, a video about how to use a library, um, everything happens in, uh, in sequences. So even uh, me walking through a door, that's one, I could do that, I could cover that in three shots, that's a sequence. I'm walking down the corridor, I put my hand on the door and push it, then I come in from the other side, that's a, a, a sequence. Um, and a scene is everything that happens in one place. So that's a useful way of thinking. Um, if you're going to go push your video a little bit beyond uh, just the one room video. Um, don't forget some housekeeping. So housekeeping is things like, often in education videos you say, hello, my name's Lizzie, I'm a lecturer in uh, paleontology. <laughs> you say that, or you say this is the course on something, something. That's a bit of housekeeping. It's quite useful for students, I think. And at the end you say, right, now you've watched this video, I want you to do something. That's the housekeeping. Um, think visually when you're writing a script. Obviously, this is video. Think about the pictures that you're going to use. Um, show, don't tell. As I said, a little bit lower down. Show something. We already discussed that. Don't say it because you don't need to. A picture says a thousand words, right? Um, use engaging words and visuals. Something that's not jargon, as we've already discussed. Something that engages the audience. That variety is really important. We, we saw in that, other, that video with a spinning um, piece of wood, the variety of the shots made it much more interesting. Um, and the balance. So you've got different elements in a video. You've got sound, music. You've got text on screen, maybe. You've got some action. You don't want anything to completely outweigh the others. There has to be some kind of balance. And that's something you um, really come to in, in post-production a lot more. Um, keep it short and simple, right? And always keep your purpose in mind. Your purpose is your story. What are you trying to say? What's the video for? Um, I wonder if I left that in. I did. How, how, can you, how can you make your script more interesting? And we've discussed a few things, make it engaging, but what can you shoot to make it more interesting? What kind of things? Instead of a man talking in the front of the... Like, rah, 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 rah. If you're going to do time management, mm -hmm. I'm only thinking about this because we've been thinking about time management is that maybe you could have a piece of film with the magic, uh, with the rabbit from Alice. You know, I'm, I'm late, I'm late, for very, and have a clock ticking away in the background and that kind of thing <laughs> to show. Well, you're doing, yeah, you're doing a little bit of, you're being, you're thinking creatively, yeah. Um, I think that, I just wanted to, to just throw a few ideas at you, really, um, which is why I put this in, just about how you could just make your videos pop a bit. Um, shooting action instead of blah, blah, blah really helps. So um, shooting people doing things really helps. Shooting people really helps. People who are interested in people. Um, uh, get some money shots in there to make it look prettier. A money shot is actually, some of them aren't that hard, you know. Uh, a time lapse isn't that hard to, to do. You can just do a time lapse by speeding up a shot. Think about putting something in there that makes your production look a bit more classy, as it were. And um, uh, maybe consider look using found footage. If you can't get a shot of something, maybe you can find it for free. Um, and there are, you can go onto vid uh, Vimeo and YouTube and find footage that people have released under Creative Commons that you can use for free. And I'm going to talk about that, hopefully, I'll get to that in the post production workshop uh, next week using found footage. And consider that when you're writing your script. Consider all those things, make it more interesting. Oof. 
I've got about 10 minutes left. <coughs> so a lot of your video is going to have a narration in it. Um, and that's recorded voice. So this is the script that you might be basing your video on just someone talking, a recorded voice, and it's covered up with pretty pictures. How do you write for a recorded voice? A lot of this I've learned through writing news reports. Um, when writing two pictures, that means if you've got a picture um, over your voice, don't describe what you can see. So, it's a picture of a snowy day. I don't say, it was snowing. I say, um, it was a cold day, even for November, or something like that. You try and give more information without describing what's in the picture, because they can already see that. However, if you're writing something that's just audio, like radio, uh, or an audio podcast, which is a cheap way of making something cool and interesting, always describe what you can't see. So, describe where you are. I'm standing underneath the hull of the SS Great Britain and it's so massive I can't see the top. That's engaging and interesting. You're describing what you feel in this place and so that they can see it in their mind's eye. Um, keep it short and to the point. I've already said you've only got 100 words per minute. That is not a lot. Uh, use a conversational tone. Imagine you're talking to a student. Imagine you're talking to your mum. That's what they always say in the BBC. Just imagine you're saying it to your mum. Try and explain it so she'll understand because she obviously doesn't know anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, keep your sentences short. Did you notice that sentence? It was short. That's how you communicate well. You don't make convoluted sentences. It's easy to do that when you're writing, but when you're talking, you don't do it. Um, avoid words and phrases that are difficult to say. Anti-disestablished antarianism. It's not going to work. <laughs> you have to be able to say it fluently. Um, avoid repeating words in the same sentence. And that, I see that so often. It's just jars when you hear it. You don't hear it on the BBC when they're saying stuff. They don't repeat a word in the same sentence. They don't say sentence twice or they don't say repeat twice because it just, just sounds wrong. Um, find another word. Um, and while you're writing, make sure your grammar's all correct and you've written it all properly so that you can read it out. You're reading a script and you're recording a voice, read it out smoothly. And while you're writing, go, how does that sound? How does it sound? Okay. Um, a piece to camera. Does anyone know what a piece to camera is? just talking at still cameras, no? It's just, yeah, it's you talking to the camera. You're being a presenter. That's a piece to camera. So that guy who was in the mountains, he should have done a piece to camera and the rest of it should have been interesting shots of things he wants to talk about, probably. Instead of him just talking to the camera the whole way through, which is what it is. Um, when, you're write, when you're preparing a piece to camera, I would advise you not to write a script. So when you can read the script, you write it. When you can't read it, well, you can't stand there in front of the camera going like this, blah, blah, blah. Uh, don't write it. Just work out what you want to say, the key words, uh, the structure of it, and then, um, and then uh, give, it a, give it a practice, and, and, and it will be much, um, much, more, much, much more natural, much smoother. Um, try and think about how you're going to interact with your location. There's no point doing a piece of camera um, in that kind of video if if there's no reason for you to be there. There's no reason for you to appear on the camera. So he's in the mountains, and he wants to show he's in the mountains, and that he's actually talking about real things. So he's standing there, but he could also pick up a rock and say, look at this rock, isn't it amazing? He could interact more with his environment and make a reason for him being there and appearing in front of the camera. Um, right, when you've done your script and you've written your words, and you've thought about your pictures, <coughs> you need to write a shot list. So you've got a script and then you've got a shot list. A shot list is a list of the uh, shots that you want to get. It's different from a script because you're ordering it by location. So, okay, if it's really basic, you're just in one place. You're just in one place. But what shots do you want to get in that place? You want to get a wide of the scene. You want to get some close-ups of the rocks. What is it you actually want to do? Write that down, and it should be based on a script, um, but it's just a list of, of all the things you want to, to shoot. Um, and if you're going to different places, which you might be if you're getting ambitious with your videos, uh, 
cut time by getting more, uh, more than one set of shots in one place. So maybe you've gone to a farm and you can get some nice shots of environment, of the, of the natural environment, as well as some shots of the sheep on the farm. You know what I mean? You've got two different uh, things you can get in one place. Cuts down time. In your shot list, I want you to include camera angles. And I'll tell you what, a bit more about camera angles in a minute. Um, but you have to consider, is it a wide shot of the whole environment? Is it a medium shot um, of, of, of the action? Or is it a close-up? Or is it a detail? Um, that's an important part of visual language. And you should include some B-roll shots. Um, and B-roll, does anyone know what B-roll means? Yes, it is fill-in. Yes, it is. It's the, the shots that aren't your main shots. So maybe you've got an interview, or maybe your main shot is you talking to the camera, but what are you going to use apart from that? What are your other shots? The, the less important shots, but they are very useful when you're editing. That's what B-roll is. Um, so, for instance, I'm interviewing someone about how they, the special way that they boil eggs. Well, maybe they make thousand-year-old eggs. <laughs> How do they do it? That's my little interview. That's my main shot. And then what am I going to shoot to cover that interview up to make it interesting? I'm going to shoot them packing the eggs, you know, the process that they go through. That's a be well. Unscripted shots that might be useful in the edit. Just be imaginative. Those should be included in your shot list. Things like, oh, maybe it'd be really useful if we're on that farm to get a nice shot of a robin in a tree just to, you know, to say what the time of year is. It's not in the script, but we're there. We might as well try. That's an in, a nice idea for you. OK, so that's what a shot list is, and it's an important part of your process. Um, then you should uh, write your interview questions if you're going to interview someone. And there is a particular skill to writing your interview questions as well. Um, you need to design them so that uh, the person you're interviewing actually says something. So don't ask yes, no questions. Did you go to the fair yesterday? Yes. What was the fair like? <laughs> Tell me what you did yesterday, OK? Um, yeah, so there's a few no notes about, about that. Now, obviously, at this stage, you've written your script, you've written your shot list. You're getting down to the nitty gritty of your planning. There's a lot of planning that you need to go through at this stage. Um, but all of you have done planning, right? So I'm not going to really talk about, about that kind of stuff. It's just basic, like, sensible things like, uh, let's make sure that my ca I've got my camera and all the bits are on my camera. Uh, let's make sure that I know where I'm going and I've got a map. Those are the kind of things that a producer or production manager does. They organise things. But you've all done that kind of stuff, so it's really not rocket science and you can, you'll probably be all right by yourself. But there is one or two things that you, a producer, in a producer's role, it might just be you, you doing everything, but that you need to consider. One of them is doing a risk assessment. We all work in institutions. Doing a risk assessment is kind of part of what you have to do, isn't it? Um, it's really simple, common sense. I'm sure you've done that kind of stuff before. Just do a risk assessment about, what, about this project that you're going to film, about the filming. Um, what dangers do you uh, foresee happening and how can you... Like if you're shooting next to a busy road, maybe you should wear a high vis. You know, it's just basic stuff like that. Having one of those pieces of paper in your folder is uh, quite useful. Another thing you, need, you should really consider doing is, uh, is release forms for your video, especially as we're all part of institutions who want to do things properly. Um, a release form is basically uh, for the people who appear significantly in your video. It do, you don't have to get everyone in your video to sign one of these release forms. If you've got people wa wandering around on the streets behind your main interviewee, you don't have to go and grab them and say, oh, will you give me your permission? We're all, um, we live in a free country. We actually have the right to film in public places. Um, but you do need to get permission from the people that you interview and the people who, are, uh, who appear significantly in your video. And what that means is something you have to decide and work out yourself, really. And that permission has to be informed. So they have to know what they're doing, why they're doing it, and what the production is, um, is going to be about. They have to know what your video is. And you give them a piece of paper. I've got an example release form in there. Um, the workshop release form is an example as well um, of the kind of thing that you should be asking people to sign. It's just a really useful thing to have um, when you make... Um, 
when you make a video. Okay, so before you set off, prepare your shooting equipment. What does that mean? Check your batteries are charged. Yeah, yeah. You got leads and uh, your tripod has a has a tripod head on <laughs> has a has a uh, camera plate in it. Bring a pen and notebook. Actually, that's really useful, and people forget it. Um, you need to write things down. Sometimes, one of the things you might need to write down is the name of the person that you're interviewing, for instance. Okay, you're ready to set off. You're ready to be zen. Now, Russ is going to talk a little bit about zen and the art of filming. A little bit. Uh, and, and he's going to talk about how you uh, the best cameraman is Zen, and what does that mean to get a good shot? They're kind of like, hmm. So Russ will cover that a little bit. Um, but it's not just uh, the technical sides of how you get a good shot, or the spiritual sides of how you get a sh good shot. There are other things you need to consider when you're shooting <coughs> that have to do with the performance and the content. And that's the kind of thing that the director looks after. So the cameraman and the director might be w one in the same. And a good cameraman will think like a director too. What shot should I get, not just? How can I make this shot look good? But director is thinking about what shot to get and thinking about what's in the shot, like how you're performing. Are you charismatic enough? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, if it's OK. I'm, I'm going over a little. Of course I am. <laughs> um, so, <coughs> to understand how to do that, you need to understand a bit about visual storytelling, <coughs> which informs everything that you do when you're making a video. How do you tell a story with pictures? Every shot needs to help tell the story. Um, you need to think illustratively. Illustratively is actually a useful word that I often have in my brain when I'm trying to write a script or trying to shoot. What, what's going to tell that story? Uh, in an efficient and interesting way. I'm boiling an egg. What is going to illustrate that action? Um, uh, we are talking about the movies here. We're talking about video. It's moving. So try and shoot action. That's how you tell a story with pictures. You're shooting things happening. You're shooting sequences. Things happen one after another. Um, I talked about beginning, middle and end when you're writing a script. That's structural. But you also think, need to think about... Um, the content of a shot, how is it going to be used illustratively at the beginning, what shots start things off, and what kind of shots end things. So um, what kind of shot would you start a video with, for instance? What's a good start? A wide shot. A wide a shot is a good shot, yeah. is a good start, yeah. yeah. You're introducing your, your environment. But you've got uh, lots of things that start things, like uh, more philosophically start things, like opening of a door, opening of a book. You could use just an opening, someone walking towards you, <laughs> maybe. Um, and an ending, the same. An ending could just be, it could be another wide, could be a closing, that kind of thing. Um, don't, forget, don't forget connecting shots. If you're shooting a, an event, people often forget the shots that connect one thing to another. So um, if you're shooting, this is very documentary, but if you're shooting someone planting rice, <laughs> I don't know if you know anything about planting rice, but they grow, it, they grow the seedlings in one field, then they pull them up and put them in another. So there's lots of shots of them pulling the seedlings up and clumping them together, and then there's lots of shots of them planting them out in the mud, one by one like this, but there's no shot connecting that uh, bringing one rice from one field to the other field. So I have no concept in my brain that there are two fields involved here. That's what a connecting shot is. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you could, like with a lecture or a conference or something, or an event like that, you could theoretically have film one aspect of it, then do a, a sped up version of people milling into a room while you talk about it, and then all of a sudden, and then you're in the next bit. Absolutely. Sort of yeah, that's a. More educational uh, example. <laughs> Good. Um, consider your mood as well. If you're trying to tell a happy story, don't have lots of shots of moody Welsh mountains, I guess. This is, this is just a little bit about the camera angles thing again. Each camera angle tells... Wow, that screen's very vibrant. Each camera angle tells a different story. So the wide is introductory, right? 
These are just a few camera angles. There's lots of different versions of these, right? But these are the main three. The medium, what's the medium do? It draws your attention generally to a <coughs> wide everything. Wide's introductory, yeah. puts, sets the scene, yeah. The it's medium. Matter, it is the subject matter. Yeah. That is exactly yeah. right. It's the action. It's what's going on. A lot of your shots are going to be medium, but try and break it up with some detail, which is the, me which is the close up. The detail explains things in more detail, right? Um, okay. <coughs> Russ is probably going to talk a little bit about shooting for the edit, but I'm going to talk about what the director's choices are. Um, when you're shooting, you kind of got to be flexible. You kind of got to go with um, what's happening. You know what your story is. You know what your script is. But maybe something else is happening. You've got to be flexible, um, and then shoot um, and shoot what the actual story of happening in front of you is. Um, shoot lots of B-roll. We've already said that, but B-roll is not just a cut away to something random. It has to be a part of your story. It has to be a cut to, not cut away. Cut to. Um, <coughs> Keep continuity, continuity. Does anyone know what continuity is? Mm -hmm. It's when uh, you know people. So, like for example, when you send as if Pat Butcher said he had one set of earrings on, then another set of earrings on, it would look ridiculous. Or you see like sleeves going up and down, or, or cars changing colour because mm -hmm. somebody hasn't. Yeah, they can be quite entertaining. Like the good good ones, a drink. Like when you see a drink jumps up and down, up and down, <coughs> up and down when you're watching. So How I, many times did they have? Because I'm like. I'm like, oh, I wonder if they've done it. Continuity errors are some, some people like watching those yeah. in films. <laughs> Every film has it. Yeah. Like, I, maybe some of you, if you watched our videos, noticed some continuity errors in our videos, because there were some. There were definitely continuity errors. Um, it's really easy to do, but try and avoid it, because it breaks the suspension of disbelief. We've all heard that, right? Suspension of disbelief. You're, trying, you're in their world. You don't want to make them go, oh, wait a minute. That's wrong. You want them to stay in your world. Um, don't shoot too much, don't shoot too little. <laughs> That's easy, isn't it? <laughs> it's, all a, it's, all about, it's all about intuition. That's what video making is. There's one, something I want to describe clear, uh, uh, very quickly to you. It's called the 180 degree rule. Do you remember? It's called not crossing the line. There's a line. Okay? There's two people. I've got a nose, I've got hair. This is a bird's eye view. <laughs> now, you've got, you're shooting those two people talking to each other. This applies across the board to, to loads of different things. Um, so I'm gonna shoot, I'm gonna shoot both of them. I can see both of them, that's my camera. La la la. Then I'm gonna shoot that person as a close up. That person is on that side of the screen. Then I'm gonna shoot that person as a close-up, that person's on the other side of the screen. Now, if you moved your camera from here over to the other side, what would happen? You'd get confused which... Who's who. Yeah. You would get confused as to who's who. So if you started shooting that person from the other side of the line, they'd be on the wrong side of the screen. So your directions would all be messed up. You can have a go at it when you're shooting this afternoon and see in real terms what that means. This is the 180 degree rule. Just remember, don't cross the line. Okay? Good line. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, now I'm go I've gone over, so I'm just gonna um, I'm gonna skip this. You're gonna have to look at it later. Um, this is a few tips on things like how to record a voiceover, how to conduct, um, how to set up an interview and conduct an interview. Um, if you want to go over it, I can talk a bit like. I can show you how to set up an interview, how, where to s put someone um, when you're conducting an interview um, during a break or something, but I'm not going to do it now. And here's some tips on, on interviewees. I thought I'd get to this, but I'm just too slow. And some tips on presenting. Um, some things to remember while you're shooting. I don't know if Russ is going to go over this, but um, I'll just give you a few tips. Look at what you're shooting regularly. You'll be able to pick up mistakes. You'll also be able to think, ah, I haven't got that shot yet. I really want that one. Uh, I better write that down on my notepad that I've brought with me. Um, back up your footage, put it on a computer, back it up onto a hard drive, keep it safe. It's really expensive. You just spent a whole day getting it. Um, 
write down the names, all the details of the people you interview. Don't forget to get release forms signed and look after your equipment. Russell mentioned that. It's very important. You don't want to lose your tripod. <laughs> right, conclusions. This, I thought I was being really um, revolutionary. I'm going to hand it over to you guys. What conclusions? What, do you what have you gained out of this? Little talk. What's the main points? Do you think? It's not as easy as it seems. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I mean, when you look at something on television, you don't realise all the hard work that's actually gone into it. Yes, yes. that is true. You're but it, in a new light. <laughs> you do. You, I mean, it looks so seamless and easy, but actually, there's so much work that goes into it. But none of it is hard work. It is all reachable. It's all. It's none of it's rocket science. It's all common sense, really. You just have to practice at it. Well, ideally, have somebody helping you. you can Help. That on your own. Yes. Like uh, film, film is <laughs> a. <laughs> you need him. Um, it is. It is a team sport. Film. Mm -hmm. It is a team sport. And if you share the burden, it makes it much easier. You preparation. Get preparation. That's really important for your. I tried to cut down the amount of time I spoke about preparation. <laughs> Maybe I didn't succeed. What else is? What have you picked up from this little talk? It has to be seamless. And if it's jarring on the screen, it's going to be jarring to your audience. Yeah. And the minute it starts jarring them, they're going to lose interest. Yeah. So making it seamless is really important when in the edit, but you have to think about how you're going to make it seamless before that. Absolutely. Yeah. In your preparation and how you shoot and your technical standards that you reach, no wind sound. <laughs> now you know what wind sound sounds like. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the other things I wanted to say was just put your brain on and think about how to make it more interesting. How are you going to get your message across in a less boring way? Try not to use slides and a voiceover. If you've got a talking head, how are you going to make it more interesting? How are you going to grab their attention? That's what I really want you to start thinking about. And the other thing is... Give it a go! It's fun! <laughs> and just to entertain you, I want you to be this ambitious. Visualization is right at the heart of my own work too. I teach global health. And I know having the data is not enough. I have to show it in ways people both enjoy and understand. Now, I'm going to try something I've never done before. Animating the data in real space with a bit of technical assistance from the crew. So, here we go. First, an axis for health. Life expectancy. From 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth. Income per person. 400, 4,000, and 40,000 dollars. So, down here is poor and sick. And up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago, in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over, Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. 
United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou. It is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace. It's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you have seen in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? Um, pressure? no pressure. <laughs> okay, so he used a lovely graphic, but what else was really good about that video? He was, he was animated and he was, infused. He was infused. He was infused. He was, he was, he did all the housekeeping, he did everything. There was a little intro at the beginning with him walking up the steps to say, ooh, what's going to happen? Um, about something that actually could be quite dull. You're talking yeah, about you numbers. Staff, you yeah, you glaze them like yeah. normally. And, but he made it relevant and exciting. And actually, that animation, um, well, it would take it would take it would take Matt half a day to do. You can ask him to, for help if you want. Okay. Seriously, you can. That's that's <laughs> that was not a complicated animation. I'm not asking you to make an animation <laughs> like that. But can you think? He was just standing in that room with a pe with some things moving in front of him. Think creatively. How would you do that in a really simple way? There are ways. That was a nice video, wasn't it? Anyway, that's me. Coffee break, everyone! <laughs>